It's a great pleasure to introduce Nell Nelson here today from Happenstance Press. Uh, Nell's a local publisher, but also a poet in her own right, a performer in her own right. For those of you who've heard Nell reading her own poetry, a very engaging um, session always to hear Nell reading her poetry. She's also a reviewer, uh, reviews for a wide range of, of journals from Ambit through to Mislexia and Magma and all sorts of other um, magazines. Um, and she uh, has her own weekly blog, which I would definitely point you in the direction of. And one of the most useful um, books on how not to get your poetry published, which is sadly out of print at the moment. But if I've, you can... I've got to write. I'm, I'm working on it. Excellent. I'm, I'm writing right on the revised, new, longer version. It's a highly sought-after it's publication. It's been written since no social networking started. To <laughs> right, yeah, phase two. Major impact. So a local publisher with lots of experience of, of how not to and how to get published. We're very grateful that Nell's able to come along and talk to us today. So welcome, Nell Nelson, Happenstance Press. Uh, wonder yeah, okay. um, I wonder if you could just tell us, first off, maybe how you got into publishing, what drew you into it, for something which gives you little uh, income and I, a lot I can, of time. I can try, but can I, can I read a poem first? Absolutely, do that. Um, I'm just, I've got this poem in here. Oh, and I should just say, the stuff on the table there, these things are for you to take away. They're all free. I don't want to carry them back down the road. So don't be polite. You know, just, if you don't like them, take them and give them to your auntie. <laughs> so this poem is called How to Piss Off Your Prospective Poetry Publisher. <laughs> How shall I tell you? So many ways. Understamping is not the worst. Nice people do it unintentionally. Perhaps, first of all, you should... Disregard the possibility that there may be submission guidelines. <laughs> if, however, you find any, ignore them. Present your work in a font slightly too small for the publisher to read comfortably. Or vary the size and type of print from page to page so as to maximise the flotsam and jetsam effect. Use punctuation here and there. <laughs> Staple the poems together without remorse. <laughs> Number every page. Tell the publisher you have written over 500 poems since last March. <laughs> Never mind about your address, but do display your name at the foot of each poem prominently, preferably with a copyright symbol, to prevent the publisher stealing your work and passing it off as her own. <laughs> Do not sign your letter. Instead, type below the space where your signature is not, J. Smith, Jones, Heaney, etc. Poet. <laughs> no need to enclose a stamped, self-addressed envelope so old-fashioned when email suits you better. Enclose some colour illustrations and a four-page curriculum vitae listing every poem you have ever had published, no matter where, or when. Do not read any of the publisher's current list to ascertain whether your submission will harmonise or shout, No! No! <laughs> Make time to ensure the last two lines of your poem's rhyme, even if all the rest do not. Include as many villanelles or sestinas as you can. <laughs> Invite the publisher to read more about you on your website. Don't forget to mention the novel, the one you are writing, at this moment. <laughs> so the, all the things in there have happened. Yeah, and it's got almost a synopsis of how not to get published, really, isn't it? So thanks for that, Mel, which gives us, I think, a, a good overview of all the not well, not all the knots, but just some of them, probably the, the primary ones that you're seeing so frequently. So we'll come back, back to, I think, some of those pointers uh, further on, but back to the roots again of yeah. you as a poet, pres presumably a poet first, and then something happened that made you think, aha, I'd like to get into publishing as well. How did that happen? Well, it's a slightly long answer to the question, but when I first started to be published, the first publication I had <laughs> was a pamphlet, and it was done by, you know, one of these sorts of little things, except mine had a yellow cover. And it was done by James Robertson, who some of you may know as a novelist. And James also has a little publishing imprint called Catalonia. And it was called Catalonia at that time because he was then based in King's Kettle in Fife. So I didn't know him and I hadn't met him and he didn't know me and hadn't met me, but he had read some poems of mine in 
magazines. So he, I can't remember whether he wrote, I think this was before email. It was before people emailed regularly. But he certainly either wrote or phoned me and said, we haven't met, but I think since I'm just down the road, we should. And I wondered if you'd like to send me some poems. So I sent him some poems, and he, when we met, and he published them in a little pamphlet. And it suddenly occurred to me that people who published things were not, they were not weird people in London that you would never know. They were not not people that worked for Macmillan and, and were rich. And they were just, you could do it and just be an ordinary person. Because James was being a novelist, but doing these wee things on the side. And I said, well, how did you know how to do it? And he said, well, I didn't. I just worked it out as I went along. He had worked in Waterstones, and that, that had been part of it. Because when you work in a book, as a bookseller, I think you see that books come from all sorts of origins, and not all of them are being published by um, huge presses. Some of them are just ordinary little people. So that was the beginning of it. And then, bit by bit, I thought, this is really interesting, and it, it would be a way to be part of part of what happens, part of what gets published in poetry. Because, I mean, I don't know how many of you are involved with, with poetry, but if you are at all, you know that it is a normal impulse to read books or magazines and think, I don't like any of those. Why don't they publish some ones that I would like? And it's, there's a little bit of you that's, well, you could do it yourself. So after I had entered and failed to win the Poetry Business Pamphlet Competition twice, I met at stands at the Poetry Festival in St Andrews, Andy Phillip, who is a poet based... Well, at that time, he was, he was based in Edinburgh. Now he lives in Linlithgow. And um, we were chatting, and uh, he had also failed to win something. And Andy's a good poet. And I said, well, I been thinking about this starting doing a pamphlet thing myself would you would you like me to have a look at your poems so he said yes and he sent them to me and I thought right that's it we'll we'll do this and that's how it started and I didn't know how to do it really I did have to find out I wrote to people and James sent me a copy of how he prepared the manuscript of two of his pamphlets and told me where he sent them so that's where I sent my first two and I copied what he did and from then on copied various other people I'm still copying people now that's how you learn I think What's the process for you as a, as a one person publisher um, how much of what we see here as the final version happens in I don't know a house in Glenrothes Oh, all. Oh, absolutely it all, all happens in a house in Glenrothes yeah. two bedrooms So you're editing everything yourself everything's coming in you're reading through it all all of that's happening on your own yeah. yeah. And how do you fund this? How do you fund it? <clears throat> it well, you, you just pay the printer and then you hope you sell enough to get the money back. And does that work out? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you manage that? <laughs> well, it, it is a balancing act. I mean, some, some titles make a bit of money and some titles lose money. And publishing pamphlets is cheap. So, well, the printing of it is cheap. I started doing first pamphlets for people. So Andy, it was his first publication. But now I don't know how the balance works out. Some of what I do is first pamphlets and some is not. And I can't remember this year how it works out. It might be about half mm. of the pamphlets. I don't do first books for people, but I do do some books. When I say no, not first books, they would be established poets that I, that I have met. But, that, but I do publish debuts yeah. every yeah every year, i.e. some the first thing a person has ever published. So do you invite submissions or do you go to people? How does that work? I have reading windows in July and December next week. <laughs> so people send in They send them in what, staple together 60 numbers. poems? Or um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what you hope is that people will read the guidelines on the website because all publishers now have some clue on the website as to how you're supposed to approach them. In the olden days, you went and read it in the Writers and Artists Year Yearbook or the Writers Handbook. The website guidelines for most publishers will be the most up-to-date and the most useful. 
and you hope that people will have read them before they send anything, in which case they would send me at the moment during my reading windows up to eight poems, unless I've already communicated with them before, in which case they get a slightly different advice, which I won't tell you now. But I will if you want to know, if you ask later. <laughs> yeah, sure. So people have sent in their poems, um, you like a few of them, then, then what happens? They, you say, oh yes, that's great, and then they come out a month later? or No. No. <laughs> no. Um, I have, a, I have a tick and smiley system. So if you said, suppose you sent me eight poems, and they're eight poems about your dog. So I read the eight poems about the dog. And if I like them, I put a tick on the bottom. And if I like them so much, I would really like to publish this poem. If I could, I put a little smiley on the bottom. And apart from the ticks and smileys, I write various comments, like, have you thought of cutting the first line? Or, I really like this bit with a box around it, but the rest doesn't work for me. Or sometimes I write on poems, this doesn't work for me, because it is a personal response. So when you get them back again, if you've got ticks and smileys, the, the, the guideline goes, the smileys are the ones I could publish, I would publish if I could, bearing in mind that I'm only publishing you know, between six and ten pamphlets a year, probably, and I really want to do six, not ten. Um, then what happens is in the next reading window <clears throat> you would send me those ones back again with another eight. So the, the aim is that over a period of time I would get enough smileys that I felt I couldn't not publish the poems. But it doesn't mean that I would publish those po that person's poems even if they had eight smileys. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that. They need about 20 smileys before we're cooking with gas as they say. And in between, because people quite often bat things to and fro with me, some of them go and get published by somebody else, which is a good outcome. And some of them win one of the competitions, which is an excellent outcome. Well, on competitions, I mean, Happenstance has won the pamphlet, um, Michael Mark's pamphlet um, competition award in 2010, was it? And uh, you yourself have won, uh, you won the Gerwood Alborough yourself. So I, I, I jointly won it. Jointly won it, yeah. yeah. So how important are these prizes? Did, did um, interest and happenstance go up when you won the, the pamphlet competition? Did it make a difference? Um, in 2010, I, again, since it, it's, although it's only 2014, going on 15 now, the difference that social networks have made in that time is quite phenomenal mm. in terms of the effect of things. The, um, I don't think it made a huge difference, but it, it, it I suppose it ups the respect ratchet a little bit. People think, oh, it must be all right. Although, this is, it's not true. I think it's, we're very competition and award-oriented, and it's a mixed blessing. It can work against people as well as for people. And people can feel that it's such a huge thing to, to, to produce a book or a pamphlet of poems. I'm not talking about for the publisher, for the poet. And if you do it, when you think of the process that you go through to do that as well as you possibly can, and then at the end of it, your friend is doing something similar and your friend wins the prize and you do not, mm. it can make you feel like your work is somehow less because it didn't win something. But actually, a very tiny number of books per year win things and pamphlets, and a huge number of them are published. And many of those that are published are marvellous books and they still don't win something. So I think it kind of blurs the, the true picture. Then once the poems are in a form like this, um, it's, it's pretty difficult to track them down in Waterstones or the mainstream shops. How do you go about f selling pamphlets when you're up against mainstream poets, which are themselves are, are difficult, and publishers are finding difficulty in selling? Yeah. Do, do, do you know how few books, of po how few books sell of poems? I mean, it's really, really small. How does anybody make a go of this? So it, it, it's really difficult selling them. The pamphlets don't sell in bookshops at all, uh, except very occasionally if it's a poet with a local bookshop and, it, and they live in a village or something. So I, I don't sell them through bookshops. I do sell them through my own shop, web sh shop, and I do sell them through happenstance subscribers. So I have about... And this is one of the things that takes up most of my time. I have about, num they number about 390 people at the moment who are officially happenstance subscribers. So basically they, they pay £10 a year and for that they get 
a pamphlet every year that tells the story of the press and what's been going on and a bit of the backstory about the publications and they get discounts so they they get the pamphlets 25% less than everybody else and they get some free gifts periodically and odd bits and pieces of things so those people because I mail shot them four times a year buy things they don't all buy things but most of them buy at least one pamphlet a year and some of them buy every single thing so I think they must be following and collecting and they're hugely important to me so without that um, I probably couldn't cover the cost but it means that when I publish a new title I'm normally sure I'm going to sell at least 50 copies through those things and that, that the authors like to sell at least another 50 so that's 100 copies um, so that's, that's the worst scenario and I can sell a lot more than that of some of them. So That's interesting. I mean, it's one of the things you, mm. you have had a blog in the past about mm. to theme or not to theme. Oh, yeah. And it, you didn't really come down particularly one way or the other, I don't think, in that. But you, you're not, you don't have a particular preference for whether there's an integrity to a pamphlet or not. All, all that you want is really good poems. Mm. If they're good poems, they don't need to be themed. Um, if the poems are a bit ropey in places, you know, some are strong and some are a bit slight... A theme will make the slighter ones work in relation to the others much better. So sometimes that definitely helps. So that if you like with a, a pamphlet, because it's short, somebody can read it all the way through. So there is a kind of integrity to the group which will support some strong and some... I don't want to... It's not weak, it's slight. You know, sometimes you read a poem and there isn't very much to it, but you really like it. You know it would never win a competition, but you still, you still like it. So that can work very well in a pamphlet. So how many would you publish of, of pamphlets that you're sending to pamphlets? I do about between, probably about 300. Sometimes it's, sometimes a bit less than that. Yeah. But I use a, a lithographic publisher, and most publishers, for the pamphlets, most publishers are printing on demand, which makes the numbers easier. And presumably you started out pre the, the big boom in social media. Has social media help sales or has it put more pressure on you to have to blog and do other things like that? It, 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 can, it can help sales. Mm -hmm. You have to be a bit careful because it can also work the other way. Um, so I think the impact of social networking on publishing and books is extremely interesting and we're really only at the beginning of mm. working out how it can work. So it's, there are ways and ways of making it work. And I think it does help. So, but but it doesn't help in a in a way that's easy to quantify. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I I do a blog entry specifically with the aim of selling something. So the aim of the blog is I am writing about one thing, and I really want to see if I can get people to buy it. I don't do this very often, but I have done it, and again, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I'll maybe get four or five people will buy it as a result of that. But in the long term, it's different. So you can, measuring it precisely is very uncertain. But what you can't tell is that the number of people that actually see something go past them. You know, you see the name go past. Uh -huh. You see the tweet go past. You see a name go past. And after you've seen that name fly past you four or five times in different networking context, something goes ping. And you think, oh, maybe I should have a look at that. And you do have a look at it. And then you buy it. And it may work like that, because I do get sales that I don't understand. And I think, why has this woman bought this? Mm. Um, so I think it's cumulative. So maybe cumulative. something about that, yeah, yeah in fact, yeah. cumulatively, yeah. yeah. So you would recommend go getting into festivals and doing readings and so on as a mechanism for, for selling pamphlets as well as online? Getting The trouble is that getting to festivals isn't mm. straightforward. No. <laughs> so you... It isn't, it isn't particularly easy just suddenly to turn into a person who's invited to read all over the place because people only invite you to read if you've published a successful publication and it's become circular and you don't get to read at a festival just by contacting the festival director and saying, please can I come and read? It, it's exactly like making a proposal to a publisher. Why would they want to have you? What <coughs> experience can you bring to it? What have you published? What evidence have we got that you're a good performer or a good reader? So that is competitive as well. Although I think there are more opportunities to, to build towards mm. doing that than there used to be in terms of small events and open mic events and so on. 
but there are just some people that some people are also just better at selling their own work than others and on balance you know I, I, I can think of poets who, who always have their books in their bag so if they meet a lady on the train she discovers inadvertently that this person is a poet and she, before she has finished the train journey she has purchased a copy of the book <laughs> which the poet just happened to have with them uh, full price. <laughs> um, th- there are people like that. Th- several of them, I know several of them, and they sell a lot of books. <coughs> I could not do this. And many of the poets that I like best personally will not and can't do that. You know, here is my book. Would you like a copy? I give. I, I, publishers say don't don't give your work away, but actually, I think it's really nice to give <coughs> work away at times. The other thing you discover is that if you publish a book of poems, I remember the horror when I discovered that with my first book that I went to places, I read at some event or other, and then afterwards the poets came up to me and said, oh, I really like that. Would you like to do a swap? So they brought out their book, and you gave them your book, and they gave you their book. And sometimes their book wasn't a book. Sometimes their book was a self-published pamphlet. (laughs) done on stapled at home and printed on the work photocopier and so (laughs) you didn't even sell all these copies you thought you would sell you were giving them to people in exchange for another book that you weren't totally sure you actually wanted but you couldn't say you didn't because that would be rude I have other questions here for Nell, but I think at this point I'll maybe just open it up to all of you. Um, can I ask a question about um, visibility um, as, a, as a poetry publisher? I just kind of, um, you, you talked about Facebook and social media um, and also festivals and getting invited to festivals and actually those chance kind of meetings, those are working. Could you perhaps describe a little bit um, the local terrain or the regional terrain and the kinds of networks? that actually might kind of um, make the press much more visible or poets much more visible in that way. Um, it, are local events quite helpful in that sense? Is there a network that one can kind of think about in the larger term? Well, every, everything connects. And the, 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 there are... Sometimes there's a, a lot of um, fuss about literary events. So on National Poetry Day, you suddenly get the impression that, you know, there's... Hundreds and thousands of people all over Britain are, are queuing up to go to poetry events and they're all desperately doing it. But actually, the numbers of people involved and enthusiastic about poetry are quite small. They are, they are actually quite small. So very quickly, if you start going to local events, you meet people who know people who know people who know people. And it doesn't. It, you just go to stuff. You just talk to people. You, you, um, you read a book of poems by somebody that you like and you write to them and they write back. And that's the beginning of your network of people do write back. So, you know, if you write to a, a famous novelist about their book, I don't know whether you would get a reply. You don't from Stephen King, because I tried one um, twice. But you do from poets. They're terribly touched when they get letters, and they do write back. And it's by taking an interest in other people that people take an interest in you. It's, it's very mutually supportive, I think. So... That, does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah. I was just wondering, um, for example, um, the stanza we all know about because it's been here for such a long time, it has such an international presence in, in Fife and St Andrews. I just wondered whether there were other um, similar events on a much more, a much smaller scale that one could think about if one was thinking about you know, poetry, particularly. When did platforms start? Um, Two so, years ago. It's only two years yeah, ago. One and a half years, yeah. Mm. Does it, is it really only as short as Yeah, that? yeah, yeah. This is our second year. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, Lindsay started the, the five base event called Platform, which is, is in a, a station master's house at Lady Bank. Mm. So it's, it's, it's as remote as it gets, really, isn't it? It's yeah. not in a town or a city. It's in a, effectively a village, although you can get the train. You can get off at the platform. Uh, yeah. and, and go back on the train. And then, since then, the Fife Rights Group has mm-hmm. been doing yeah. events in Fife as well. I know there are several events that happen in Dundee too. So all sorts of stuff happens all the time. And there, there will be events that I don't even know about, I hope. You know, where there are little groups of people meeting together, reading stuff together and, and talking about it. 
So it, ha it happens all the time. Stanza, you think it's so well established and has been around so long, but it's not, it's not that long. Um, 15, 15 years or so. I can't remember how long it is, but, and, and, and really it's, it's been like a... It was only established as a charity, what, about... I can't remember, maybe 10 years ago? Mm -hmm. if, if it's as long as that. It's got bigger as it's gone, because to begin with it was a, it was a tiny little event that used to run, if I remember rightly, every two years. Um, locally in St Andrews and it was, you know, people from the university went to things and it was all a bit amateurish but charming and then it sort of got bigger and bigger but that, you know, festivals also don't necessarily last forever because they, as it gets bigger it's heavily dependent on funding, major funding otherwise they can't do it at all so things that depend on funding are always at risk Sally Evans' calendar event is kind of oh, in the yeah, middle ground, yeah. isn't it? Well, Sally is, is, is not year. funded at all. No, she pays for the whole thing, yeah. basically, out of her yeah. shop for takings. Mm -hmm. So Sally Evans is the editor of Poetry Scotland, and she has a she and her husband Ian run a second-hand bookshop in Calendar. So they have they have what they call the Calendar Weekend in September every year, and they just invite people to come, and they have readings in the bookshop and in the garden at the back of the bookshop, and sometimes in the hall opposite it. And it, there's a, it has a loyal following. People just go. And it's bizarre. I mean, it's bizarre and eccentric and remarkable. So it's something to which everyone should go. Because it's, you know, it, would be, it will be remembered. At some point, it will have chapters in books where people are remembering the cultural life of Scotland in the early 21st century. And they will say, and then there were the calendar <laughs> weekends. And really, there are people when you go there that just are remarkable even to look at, <laughs> never mind when you hear them reading from their poems. It's extremely entertaining, and it's a wonderful, eclectic mix run in, a, in an enormously generous way. Uh, Sally is, is just very welcoming to anybody who is interested in poetry. You're welcome to go, and it's, and it's great. It doesn't cost you anything, although it does if you pay to stay in calendar, which some people do because it's so nice. There are quite a few people here who maybe haven't yet published poetry but who are sort of setting out on writing their own poetry. What, what, what's the route for them? They're not probably at the point of sending off to happenstance, open window um, well, in December, can. but they, can. they could, yeah. Because uh, I don't just read with a view to publishing the work. I read t just to give some feedback to people. So, so that's a great opportunity. You don't, have, you don't have to send stuff in order to say, please, will you publish it? You can just send it to say, could you just give me a... A response, yeah, and I think that's I think that's a nice thing. That is so it fantastic. Rare, actually, yeah, yeah. yeah. it, it might be you unique. You just get back a no or a yes, <laughs> yeah. or no feedback at all, but you yeah. you do a great job. It's a fantastic that? opportunity yeah. for everybody to take up. But apart from that, the the route, you know, there are exceptions. What I would say is that if you're thinking about, if in the long term you think that you're writing and you might want to have writing published, that one of the things that you should do is every time you meet a writer whether it's a poet or a novelist or any kind of writer, is ask them their story. Ask them how they did it, how, they, how it got started. Because it's different in every case, and sometimes it's not what you would expect. So you start to build up in your head a sense of the different ways that people actually get these opportunities. Because you can create opportunities for yourself if you're aware of the kind of opportunities that exist. But sometimes there are things that just wouldn't occur to you. Um, the poetry normal route is through the magazines. You know, that you send poems to magazines, the magazines print them, and you go up market through the magazines. So you go from the magazines that are easy to get into to the ones that actually pay you money, and which are like entering a competition in themselves to get them to print your poems. And that when you've printed enough of them in prestigious places, then publishers might be interested so that's the kind of established route but it's the established route because this is the secret the secret is that if there is a publisher that you have in mind who you would like your work to be published by let's say it's Faber and Faber and it's poetry and you want Matthew Hollis to publish your first book of poems when you're poems arrive on his desk assuming they make it, make it there he must pick them up and think aha 
here's Leonard Smith. I'm going to enjoy reading these, or about time. So the key is that the person knows who you are before they read the work. And there's lots of ways that they could know who you are before you read the work. But in order to find out what those ways are, ask people. Because <laughs> it's different for different people. It is unlikely that when your poems arrive on Matthew Hollis's desk and he looks at them and thinks, Leonard Smith, uh, <laughs> Jane Bloggs, Ishi Doshi Kanshi, whatever that, they're just names. They're just names. And they see so many of them. They need to know your name. And they need to know your name and have a warm, fuzzy feeling when they see it. Okay, any other questions? Okay, um, again, it's uh, to follow up on um, um, Lindsay's question, it's about editing. Um, could you say a little bit about the editing process um, as the poems come into you? How much do you intervene in them? How much? It's always a jumping act in editing about preserving the personal voice and actually making it kind of hit an audience much more. Um, editing is different with different publishers and some publishers don't edit at all they just they publish the work has to be in finished shape effectively apart from the odd little tweak here and there like are you aware you finished six poems with the word love for example uh, a publisher should notice that kind of thing but I, I'm very hands on so I do make lots and lots of suggestions about poems um, and what I do is send back the suggestions and Sometimes I, I just say this works perfectly, don't change anything. But sometimes I say, you've got three stanzas and I think only the third one works, but I think it would work as a poem on its own right. What do you think? But I send back the comments and, and then let them either, either work with them or ignore them. Because essentially what you want is for poets to develop enough confidence that they know whether you've made a useful comment or, or one that really is not going to help with a particular poem. So, but I, I, do, I do make quite detailed comments to, to people. You can work with and for some people and not others. So, and I think that that's an, partly an accident of chance, that some people you're in, in sympathy with the way that they're writing. So the kind of feedback that you give, they look at it and they think, some people think, why didn't I think of that? Because you have actually made a comment that is in sympathy with the way that they work. But other people, you can make a comment and they think, who does she think she is? You know. So it, it, it's that. The, the process that I do where I get people to send poems in the, in the reading windows and send some feedback is partly to establish on both sides whether I'm a good person to work with for that poet. Because all the emphasis these days is on how do you get your work published? Like, you know, when you get it published, you've, you've struck gold. But actually, it isn't, it isn't like that. You need it to be published by somebody you can work with and to have the process work for you in a way that's positive. Because hopefully, you don't just publish one book. You know, you're going to do more stuff. So you need to learn and have a good and fruitful experience. And it isn't always so. So some people do get work published that they later regret having had published or in the way that they've had it published. So I, I, I won't leak any more than that on film. <laughs> <laughs> any more questions? It'd be a controversial one, but interesting to hear. Um, what's your feeling about academic courses and creative writing? Do, are they a headache because there's just more and more writers being churned out across Scotland and Britain and across the world generally, then sending stuff in to happenstance and all the rest of it. I mean, is, is it now something that's just everybody's doing it and there's too much out there, as you say, you're, you're benefiting from having limited time to write your own poems and here we all are devoting our 24 hours a day to being committed uh, as undergraduates and postgraduates in creative writing. I, th I think that some of the MAs and MLITs and degrees in creative writing are a fabulous opportunity for people and that they do some wonderful things. I do get a lot of submissions from people who've just finished a course and I am very aware that on the course they haven't done any work on how to approach a publisher because they've done it really wrong. So 
even if the course has been a very good experience for them, their approach is rubbish. So, for example, I'll give you an example. It will be a person who writes a letter and they say, I've just achieved my M lit with distinction from X. Um, and I enclose a sequence of the poems I submitted for my final, whatever it is, portfolio, whatever the, the, it's called, dissertation, whatever they call it in the particular university, which were highly praised by my tutor X. Sometimes even by my tutor X, who suggested I might send them to you. Not one of these poems has been published anywhere, in any magazine. So I'm seeing them as it's like the finished work that the university got. The poet may not have any background in publishing either. They haven't published any work. What they've done is a university course. So, A, they've created, they've created an unfair pressure on the reader because they're sending you work that somebody else has rated distinction quality. So that's not good because you come to it with this little voice at the back of your head saying, another distinction, eh? <laughs> and honestly, there's a lot of distinct people writing with distinctions in something. You say, another distinction, let's see what this one has to offer. And, 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 and you're also thinking, and I don't think they've read the guidelines on the website because they've done X, Y, and Z. I don't know, they sent 20, not 10, or whatever. There's various things that they haven't done. And they have no track record. There's no public... And it, on my website, and on most publishers, it will say... You should have some track record with good quality magazines before we would consider publishing your work. So, if they'd approached it in a different way and said, um, I've read the guidelines on your website, I've just finished my MLIP with distinction in Cardiff or whatever it is, um, and I, I haven't really got started with approaching magazines, but I wondered if you would give me some feedback on eight of the poems I did for my uh, final uh, portfolio, that would be okay. I would just give them feedback. But sending a set of poems with en- no background, with the kind of as an invitation to me to publish it, publish them. No, I, w- I wouldn't publish these. But also, it just is not. It's created the wrong mindset for me when I start to read. Them. So I don't know if that helps or no, not. No, no, no. So it, it, I'm not, not. I don't feel antagonistic towards people doing university qualifications in creative writing. I think some great stuff can come through doing it, and I think it's a fabulous opportunity for people to do it. But I don't think that the courses themselves necessarily prepare people for the right way to make publishing approaches. And I think that more of them should do that. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you're suggesting that. As people go through their MLIP, they should be submitting at the same time, alongside. I think as people do MLIPs, they should be sending poems to magazines, not thinking, I haven't got enough emotional space to do that at the same time as preparing the poems for my tutor. Yes, because it's, it's a, otherwise it's a whole year in which you haven't done any of that stuff, and you can say, oh, well, and you might never have done it. So, yeah, you should just start, just start. And if they get bounced back... It doesn't matter. You start your rejection slip collection. It's a worthy collection. Well, I think on that positive and uplifting note for all of us as students at the Dundee University, many thanks to, to Nell Pleasure. for coming along today and giving us a, such an insight into publishing and poetry writing and, and her life as both poet and publisher. And um, so I hope some inspiration for all of you to think about both of those different dimensions of your own work. Um, very grateful that you gave us uh, your time and we look forward to the reprint of How Not to Publish because um, we've got the poem there which kind of encapsulates it but I think it's just given us a bit of a, a thirst for the, the rest of that little publication and uh, as, as Nell said um, some examples of, of uh, happenstances work here for you to have a look at and take away but take away and take away and take away <laughs> and uh, sub- I think subscription um, leaflets there as well because as you've heard there are, there are lots of little bonuses with happenstance press there's something about the that kind of intimate relationship that you can bond with with Nell in um, sending in your poems during the windows and getting little uh, postcard poems sent to you and little examples of, of the, the pamphlets that are coming out so it's a really a really fantastic deal for is it currently 10 pounds yeah. That's a fantastic deal, just even to get the feedback that you get, um, which is so worthwhile. Rejections come for all sorts of reasons, and it's how you receive them as much as how they're given. But uh, I think we've had a really, a really straightforward 
truthful insight into the world of, of small press pamphlet publishing and our huge thanks to, to Nell for giving up some time today to come and talk to us and I think she'll be going on now to St Andrews where she will be promoting Blaise Montezuma okay. tonight as part of the Stanza kind of outreach ongoing programme so Nell Nelson thanks very much Thank indeed. You.